Now, some of you may remember, or at least have heard of, Harold Wilson's white hot heat of technology speech, his famous speech about transforming Britain, which in many ways set the direction for the Wilson government, the first Wilson government at any rate. And I was talking to Wes Streeting over the last few days, the Shadow Health Secretary, and he described Keir Starmer's recent speech at Braintree in Essex as his white hot heat of technology speech. The Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices. At the next election, the NHS is on the line. We've got to fix the fundamentals, renew its purpose, make it fit for the future. It was about the NHS, and that was partly because it's a speech which leans very heavily on AI and new technology to resolve some of our health problems. But I think much more, it was because this was a speech intended to say, this is what a future Labour government would be for. Let's just talk a little bit about the NHS, because I think there's a real paradox in our attitudes. Even now, almost all the pollsters, when they ask people, what makes you proud to be British? Right at the top, we're head of the royal family or our history or the Navy or anything else. The NHS is at the top. And yet, if you look at the latest polling about satisfaction with the NHS, it's something like 29% or 27%. It's right the way down there. The worst it's been since 1983 when they started asking this question. So we are both, in theory, proud of it and in practical terms, almost giving up on it. There has been a rush of people into private healthcare around Britain and all of those headlines about yet more strike ballots, about ambulances not turning up, about the lack of dentists and so on and so forth, have given people a sense, not only that the NHS is broken and crumbling, but that in our time, we cannot really repair it. We haven't got the money, we haven't got the energy, we can't do it. And in a way it's a symbol for politics and the state more generally. This sense that these days the state can't really do anything effectively. These days you might as well almost give up on politics, certainly on centre-left politics. It's all for the birds. It can't be done. Sort the NHS out, of course, and that entire mood of deep cynicism could begin to turn. To everyone working in the NHS today, serving on the front line, I say thank you. Thank you. Without you, there would be no light at the end of the tunnel. But I also say, the walk towards that light will be hard, will feel challenging, difficult. But do not doubt it's essential and that the reward for reform will be worth it. Ever since he reneged on some of those promises, that he made when he became Labour leader right at the beginning. A lot of people have said of Keir Starmer, he doesn't really stand for anything. We don't know who he is, he's got no core. And I think this speech absolutely refutes that. I've always thought that Starmer is a much steelier, tougher, more ruthless politician, focused entirely on getting into power than people give him credit for. But the question is, what's it all for? What would a Starmer government do? And I think this Braintree speech answers that. This is an incredibly ambitious speech for the NHS. The next Labour government will deliver an NHS that is there when you need it. Ambulances, seven minutes for cardiac arrest. a and &E, back to the four hour target. GPs, the highest satisfaction levels on record. Waiting lists down. Planned treatment within 18 weeks. No backsliding, no excuses. We will meet these standards again. We will get the NHS back on its feet. Now, what Starmer's speech says is I am going to answer, I'm going to go back to all of those original targets on waiting times, on GP surgeries and all the rest of it, and we're going to accomplish all of them, all of them, within the first term of a Labour government. Uh, no excuses, no backsliding, we are going to do this. And at the same time, we're going to do a lot more. We are going to ensure that three quarters of cancers are diagnosed at stage one and two, which gives you a much better chance of surviving them. We are going to make sure that a quarter of all strokes and heart diseases are dealt with much, much faster than they are at the moment. We're going to get the ambulance times down for people with cardiac arrests. Above all, they're going to really, really focus on the mental health epidemic sweeping young people in this country. Suicide is now the highest cause of death among young British adults. That is utterly, utterly shameful. And Starmer is saying, I will sort that.
Now, these are vast, vast promises. And he's talking about health inequality around the regions of the UK as well. Really, really big promises. Now, I think, given how important the NHS is to all of us, and I'm only sitting here talking to you because of the NHS, 10 years ago, I had a massive stroke. My family were told, first of all, that I would die. And secondly, after it was clear that I wasn't going to die, that I would spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair, unable to communicate. And here I am entirely because of the NHS. And I think many people watching this will have similar kinds of dramatic stories about themselves or their close colleagues and family. So this really, really matters. We care about it. It is the template. It's the touchstone of cynicism about politics more generally. And all of that means that Starmer absolutely has, if he becomes prime minister, to deliver on the promises he gave in this brain tree speech. Fail on this and his government fails completely. Fail on this and the NHS will dissolve entirely and will be back into a kind of Americanized, privatized healthcare system. This is by far the biggest issue facing the country at the moment. Much, much more important than all the nonsense this week about Suella Braverman and so forth. This is what we should be focusing on. Now, in terms of what it means for the future Labour government, of course, he has raised the bar very high in this speech. He has raised the stakes and he has raised the level of jeopardy. Because if you're going to accomplish these things, it clearly does need some more money and it's going to need more money than the 3.2 billion that Labour thinks it will get by changing the non-DOM tax arrangements. Up to now, Rachel Reeves has been very, very steely indeed about restraining spending, ensuring there aren't uh, new promises that they can't fund entirely. Starmer has made this personal and he has said there will be no backsliding, no failure on this. This is him. If we believe in him at all, we have to believe in these promises and they have to be kept. The Tories will never deliver this. They voted against the NHS right at the start and more than once. And while they've come to accept it as part of the political furniture, in their heart of hearts, they don't believe in its central promise. For them, it's a cost, not a cause. And from that mindset springs the well of their neglect. The NHS will be 75 at the beginning of July. It has gone through one of the most cataclysmic periods in entire history, all the way through the COVID crisis when we were all clapping, and now these endless strikes, the first strike by the Royal College of Nursing in its history, and all of that. This is a speech which, if it is honoured by a future Labour government, changes the course, not just of the NHS, but for politics and centre-left politics in this country for the next generation. I think it is that important. If you'd like to stay up to date and you'd like to see the latest explainers, field reports, feature stories and special discussion episodes, then please, folks, subscribe to our channel today. Brought to you by Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Experienced wealth managers who go above and beyond to guide and support you. Can do is more than just an attitude. Can do is navigating today for a brighter tomorrow.